many of you who have been asking and connecting and asking for updates. Um, just even asking for the updates, we're, we're very appreciative of, of that. So thank you all for your continued uh, prayers. And uh, Moira is doing better, uh, but can still continue to use prayer. Uh, prayer for the relief of, of her system. So if you could uh, keep that in mind, we'd, we'd appreciate that as well. Um, and speaking of, of prayer requests, obviously um, the sort of traditional way that you guys have, have done prayer requests is, is a little bit difficult. Uh, and so what we're going to try to do to honor the fact that we want to be praying for the needs of the congregation, uh, what we're going to attempt to do is give you guys some opportunity to shoot me prayer requests uh, during the week. Um, if you can, if you have a prayer request that you would like to be prayed for uh, during the Sunday morning service, I'd ask that you shoot me an email, uh, you can send me a text, uh, you can even Facebook Messenger me if you have a prayer request that you would like to have recorded or uh, prayed for during the service. Uh, I'd just like to invite you to do that. Also, uh, if you drop a prayer request uh, in the offering link, uh, or the Sunday morning service, as long as it's written legibly, um, I will uh, be checking the plate just before the service uh, and we'll grab those requests as well. Uh, again, it's not ideal. What we would really love to do is be able to go back to passing the microphone around and hearing from all of you, but because of uh, the state of things, it's just not a feasible thing. Uh, and so we still want to honor that time and that space for, for prayer requests. Uh, we, like so many other things, have to figure out how to navigate that a little bit differently right now. So if you have prayer requests, um, again, please feel free to text them, email them to me, Facebook Messenger, or drop them uh, in the, the offering plate that, that's in the back, and I'll, I'll check that before services. Uh, also, uh, we have our online uh, prayer room uh, and Bible study tonight uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, the link will go up on our Facebook page around 6.30. Uh, probably easiest to click into it uh, right around uh, 6.55. Uh, if you would like uh, to join but aren't on Facebook, let me know and I can email that link to you as well. You don't have to be on Facebook to join us. All you need is the link. We'll be spending some time in prayer this evening and we'll be uh, studying uh, in the book of Mark Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, if you're interested. Uh, let's see here. Um, just a couple of other reminders. We are having our, our youth outing will be this coming Saturday, uh, August 8th. We'll be meeting here at the church uh, at 8.30 for, for our youth. Uh, again, our yard sale uh, will be on August 15th as well. Uh, you can continue to leave donations in the basement. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, Tithes and offering. Um, again, the offering plate is in the back if you uh, have tithes and an offering to give. All right, so with that all being said, um, we're going to do our call to worship just a little bit differently uh, today. Typically, I, I read it, um, but I've got a video uh, that will sort of read for us. It's got some fun music playing in the background. Uh, we'll still do our, our time of, of silent meditation and contemplation this morning, uh, but just like to invite you to be attentive to the words uh, of, of the video, uh, and um, I guess I would say use it to prepare yourselves and prepare your hearts for, for our time of worship this morning. is <coughs> trustworthy in all he promises, and faithful in all he does. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion endures through all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to him, and he gives them their food at the proper time. He opens his hand and satisfies the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on you, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak.
Uh, now I'd like to invite you just to be still and be quiet before God. Our lives are hectic. They are busy, full of anxiety, full of fear, full of great frustration and difficulty right now. And so now I invite you just to be still. If you need something to focus on, there's a verse from uh, the psalm that we just heard uh, read this morning. Just invite you to be still and to be quiet and to be in God's presence over the next few minutes. Lord, we need you to give us strength and wisdom to deal with the circumstances that are in our lives that that seek to overwhelm us. Lord, we need to be in your presence this morning because you are our hope, you are our salvation. You are our deliverer. Your word tells us that when we are in times of difficulty, that you are our rock, our shield, that you are a balm to us when we need to be healed. And so, Lord, we enter into worship this morning knowing that we need you, knowing that there is no hope apart from you. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would rest upon this place, that as we worship you, as we seek to give you honor and glory, 
as we seek to offer praise. We recognize that sometimes that is difficult because our minds are distracted, because we're tired or weary. Sometimes, Lord, it's because we don't know what to say or how to say. And so we ask, come Holy Spirit. Rest upon us. Ease our burdens. Bring us peace. Bring us hope. And remind us of your un family love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are continuing our Sing Your Conscience policy. Um, again, we're not always entirely certain the best course of action, uh, and that applies in, case, in the case of, of singing. Uh, and so we invite you, uh, if you feel comfortable, uh, you're more than welcome to sing. If not, uh, that is fine as well. And so we invite you to sing your conscience. Uh, and our first song this morning uh, is More Than Conquerors. <laughs>
Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you this morning living in the tension of gratitude and thanksgiving for the poor and hungry. We ask that you provide for their needs and that you would use us as the body of Christ, as your church, to care for them. Lord, grant us wisdom. Many of us are facing difficult choices about how to interact with the world around us because of COVID-19. They're constantly bombarded by different opinions, truths and mistruths, mistruths about how we should react. Give us the wisdom to see the truth, to embrace the truth, and to love the truth. Show us the way forward so that we may walk in faithfulness and love our neighbor well. And for those who are battling with COVID-19, we pray for a quick and speedy, speedy recovery. For those who are more vulnerable, Lord, if they get the virus, or those who are trying to, to actively avoid it because they are immunocompromised, Lord, we pray that you would protect them, keep them safe. And Lord, we ask that you bring a quick end to this pandemic. And God, we pray this morning against racism in all its forms and manifestations. Your word is clear, it is wrong to hate and to show preference based on the color of skin. And Lord, we ask that you would guide each of us to stand against hate and stand for the love of neighbor, regardless of skin color. May we all examine ourselves to see if we have sinned in this area. Lord, we ask that you would show us where we can do better. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm not entirely sure if we have the ability to project songs at the moment. Are we close? Are we good with that? We can do a song? Awesome. All right. So, we, um, again, will invite you to sing your conscience. This next song is about God's faithfulness to us. Um, sometimes it can be easy for us to forget that God is there. He is a constant for us and that he is faithful. And so I ask that as you either sing or don't sing this morning, that you would be reminded of God's great faithfulness to us.
This week starts off a four-week journey through the book of Jonah. I've always had a deep appreciation for the book of Jonah because I found him to be, I would say, the most relatable of characters in the Bible for me. Jonah and I have a lot in common, and I'm going to share a little bit about that uh, as we go through the next four weeks, but for now, I'd like to dig into Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do, or what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered the sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We begin our story with a reluctant prophet called to go someplace he does not want to go, to be a prophet to a people. He does not want to help. It's unclear to us in this first chapter why Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. We will get our answer to that question eventually, in a few weeks, when we get to chapter 4. But at the moment, all we know so far in the story is that Jonah didn't want to go where he was called to go. So he decided to run to Tarshish, in the opposite direction of the destination he was called to go. To paint a picture for you, Nineveh was located in modern-day Iraq, and Tarshish was in southern Spain. The two cities are approximately 3,000 miles apart. Jonah wanted to put as much distance between himself and Nineveh as he could, and so he fled. I don't know about you, but man, that is super relatable to me. I have 
oftentimes experience that want, that desire, that instinct to want to call, uh, to want to run. When I was 15 years old, I became a Christian. I decided I was going to follow Jesus. I was at a summer camp. A couple of days later, after that moment where I, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I needed Jesus and that I needed to follow after him wherever he led, that, that I had a call of ministry on my life. And then I so years running from that ministry. Running because I didn't think that I was capable. Running because I didn't think I was worthy. Running because I didn't think standing in the pulpit that I had anything of value or anything of worth that I could say. I spent a long time running. Fleeing, in fact. Because I didn't think that God <coughs> Because I was afraid. So afraid Maybe this will help paint a picture. When I was in ninth grade, I, I was so afraid of public speaking that I took a speech class and never once gave a speech. Don't ask me how I managed to navigate that. I still to this day don't know other than a very gracious teacher who let me write instead of give speeches. But the very notion of public speaking, of being in front of people, was horrifying to me. And even today, after doing it for a number of years, I still get the butterflies. I still feel the weight of it. I still get kind of nervous. Um, and it, it's, a scary, it's a scary thing for me. But eventually, as you might have guessed, I stopped running from that call to ministry. One day, uh, as my wife was pregnant with uh, our son, Colm, it just sort of dawned on me that if I'm going to be the, the husband and the father that God has called me to be, then that means stepping into the call that he has called me to. So like Jonah, I understood what it is to run, to know that God wants you to do something, to be terrified of it, want to escape it, and do whatever you can to get away from it. Oh, I certainly justified my running, as does Jonah. I justified my running, my running by saying things like, well, I'll just help out in the youth ministry. It's close enough to doing what God called me. Or I'll help out by teaching Sunday school. Or I'll help lead this ministry or, or, or do this task in the church. All of those things, very good things, but really not the thing that God had called me to do. And so, I get that instinct that Jonah had to run away. I've lived it, I've experienced it. It's why Jonah is such a relatable character in the scriptures for me. I get Jonah's want to run away. And at this point in the story, we have no idea why Jonah was running. I get the instinct the compulsion to flee when God asks you to do something that you're not comfortable with doing. I have to imagine that I'm not alone in that. Gosh, I hope I'm not alone in that. We've probably all experienced having a very clear sense of God asking us or wanting us to do something, but instead of wanting to faithfully follow through, we try to put as much distance between ourselves and God as we can. But what we find out as we continue to read through Jonah is that there is ultimately no running from God. There is no place that we can go that God is not present. The psalmist in Psalm 139 says it this way. Where can I go? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. 
If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. The psalmist knew. He knew, and I would guess from experience, what Jonah at this point in our story is unable to grasp. He was going to be unable to flee from God no matter where he went. Jonah flees to Tarshish, again in the complete and utter opposite direction of Nineveh. And then things begin to go horribly wrong for him and the crew on the ship. A violent storm arises while Jonah is in a deep sleep below. And the captain goes and he wakes up Jonah and wants him to pray to his God to help save them. And the crew in their distress begins to cast lots to determine the cause of the horrible storm that was raging all around them. And the lots fall to Jonah. And this sets up a flurry of questions about Jonah, culminating in the crew asking him, what do we do? And his response, knowing his responsibility in all of this, was throw me overboard. Now the men obviously did their very best not to have to do that, but eventually the storm became so much that they agreed to toss Jonah into the sea, begging and pleading as they did it for God not to hold them responsible for Jonah's death. When they tossed him, the sea grew calm, and the fear of the Lord was upon them. The crew then made sacrifices and offered vows to the Lord after seeing what he was capable of. And as the chapter closes, we see that Jonah is in the belly of a great big fish provided by God to save Jonah from dying in the sea. Jonah's plan to run away had failed, and now he finds himself stuck in the belly of a fish. And we see through Jonah's mistake the folly of trying to run away from God there are consequences for doing so. Attempting to run away from God hurts us. We might think that we're getting away, but eventually the consequences of trying to run will catch up with us. It's pretty likely that any of us will end up in the belly of a giant fish, but there are still going to be consequences. And one of the most significant of those consequences is that running from God profoundly affects our intimacy with him. If you notice, all through the first chapter of Jonah, Jonah makes no effort, no effort to interact with God at all. He certainly claimed to worship God, but at no point did he actually pray, call out to, or otherwise attempt to engage with God in the middle of the storm. The running directly affected the intimacy between Jonah and God. The same is true for us. When we run, our relationship with God is directly impacted. Henry Nouwen wrote about this in his book, return of the prodigal son. He says, the farther I run away from the place where God dwells, the less I am able to hear the voice that calls me the beloved. And the less I hear that voice, the more entangled I become in the manipulations and power games of the world. When our intimacy with God is impacted, when it's affected, it becomes more difficult for us to hear and recognize his voice 
and the more likely it is for us to become entangled in the way that the world does things. Running from God also profoundly affects those around us. Jonah's rebellion affected his crew. He put their lives in danger. Now, Jonah certainly couldn't predict exactly how God was going to react to his running. But as soon as the storm popped up, he knew that it was his fault, that they were all in the situation that they were in. Again, most of us are probably not going to find ourselves running from God on a boat, surrounded by terrified crew members, casting lots to figure out why the storm is happening. But again, when you try to walk, run away from God, there are going to be unintended consequences. One of those lies that is often told in our culture is that we can do whatever we want as long as we don't hurt anybody else. But the problem with that is there are very few things that we do in life that don't have some sort of impact or ripple effect on other people around us. Believing that our actions only affect us is an illusion. Life doesn't work like that. The consequences might not always be obvious to us, but they are very real and can sometimes be life or death. The consequences of Jonah's mistake could have been devastating to that ship and to that crew. We have no sense that Jonah was trying to be malicious or that he meant for the ship to be in harm's way. He was just trying to get away, but his actions had repercussions that could very well have been deadly. We need to understand that our actions, particularly our rebellious actions, are going to affect others around us. Sometimes it will affect people that we don't know. Other times it could affect the people that we know and love and hold dearly. We have to be careful to keep in mind that our actions have consequences that can be far-reaching and oftentimes can be beyond what we can control. There is no such thing as doing what we want and not harming other people. Careful reflection and self-examination of our hearts and motivations are necessary for us to make sure that we're being attentive to God's call our lives, and that we're being faithful and obedient in everything that we do. Again, if you notice at the beginning of Jonah's story, there wasn't a whole lot of reflection. He didn't stop to ponder. He didn't stop to think. He didn't even stop to pray. There was no, let me think through the consequences of this with Jonah. Again, Probably something that at certain points and times in our lives we can all relate to. The impulse to, to act without giving a lot of thought to our actions. Jonah didn't take the time to think through what he was doing. He just ran. Taking the time to pause and let the Lord examine your heart when you feel that desire, when you feel that inclination or impulse to run, can be a big help to us. Let's jump back to Psalm 139. This time we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. Here the psalmist reminds us of the power of allowing God to examine and show us our hearts, our motivations, the psalmist says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If you feel compelled to run away from the Lord, take some time to pause. Even if it's just a breath, take some time to pause and ask God to search your heart, to help you to see what makes you so anxious about doing what he is asking you to do, and then to remove what might be offensive in us and to step into a better way of living our life, a more faithful way, and to lead us into the way everlasting. See, we are not great as a culture, as a society, about pausing. We are really good about moving from one thing to the next on our calendar, from one moment to the next. But being still, being silent, even being willing to be bored, is not something that we are all that comfortable with. And that gets us into so much trouble. We need to be a people, particularly as the body of Christ, who invite people to pause, to be still, to be a people who are contemplative and who are quiet before the Lord. We see none of that in Jonah's story. None of that willingness just to sit and to pause and to really dig into why he felt that need to run, why he felt that, that impulse, that desire. We as the body of Christ need to really be countercultural. Our culture embraces, rewards, and holds up busyness as a virtue as if our whole worth is based on whether or not we're busier than our neighbor. But that is not the way of Jesus. We need to find those moments in our life where we can pause and be still, where he is able to, where we allow him to examine our hearts and show us those things that, that are standing in the way of being intimate with him, that, that are standing in our way of a really stepping out and living in faithfulness. Your busyness does not define your self-worth. Your busyness does not determine your value. Your busyness does not define you. And in this, we need to be countercultural. Not only living it out in our own lives, but inviting other people to be quiet and to be still and to allow God to enter in and examine their hearts as well. Jonah was impulsive, to say the least. And I have been impulsive in my own life as well. It was easier to run, to run from my calling than it was to actually face up, at least in my mind, to face up to what God had wanted me to be and do. <coughs> I invite you this morning, when you feel that compulsion, that impulse, like Jonah, to run, take a breath, and take another, and take another, and allow God to examine your heart, and show you why you're running, and to pull whatever is offensive out of you, so that you might be able to faithfully walk wherever God is leading. And so our take-home point this morning Again, that main point, that thing that overarching is overarching in the sermon that I, I would love for you to spend time and think about this week. Our take-home point is this. You can't run away from God. Again, you can't run away from God. There is no place 
that you can go, that he is present. And our action point today, that practical application of our take-home point is this. If you find yourself in a position where you are currently running away from God, or if you're considering running away from God, take time this week to allow God to examine your heart and to show you why. Pay close attention to Jonah's lack of intimacy with God and how his actions had consequences, not only for him, but for those around him. Step into living out Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, to allow God to examine your heart, to show you where you may be running from him, and to consider why you might be running. Let him show you where you need to be obedient and to lead you into the, into the way everlasting. Let's pray. Lord, we look at Jonah and we find somebody who I think is relatable to us. We see that he ran and we have all experienced that running. And so, Lord, we ask this morning that you would show us those places in our lives where we are running, where we might need to stop and take a breath and examine our heart and our motivations to let you show us where we need to change and be different. Lord, it might be fear. Could be anxiety. Could be any number of different things that keep us from following where you lead, Lord. And so we ask that we would be more than conquerors when it comes to our fears and our anxieties. Lord, we pray that you would help us to conquer those things, that we may better serve you. We pray this in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next week, we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 2. We'll see Jonah's response to being in the belly of a big giant fish. So I ask that you would tune in and join us next week as we continue our study in the book of Jonah. Um, this next song again will invite you to sing your conscience. Um, this is one of my favorite songs going back quite a ways. Um, so I would invite you, uh, again, if you're not comfortable with singing, just be meditative. Uh, be mindful uh, of the words uh, as we uh, sing shout to the Lord.
there is nothing that compares to the promise that we have in him. Let's pray. Lord, you are good to us beyond measure, beyond thought and comprehension. Lord, as we leave here today, as we move through the rest of our week, Lord, help us to live as the body of Christ, to love you and to love our neighbor. Help us in our fears and our anxieties. Give us peace, give us strength, and give us grace. Because you tell us in your word that your grace is indeed sufficient. We pray this in and through the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We'll dismiss this morning as we have been. We'll begin our dismissal uh, with this side of the sanctuary.